As we return to Thomas's story, we're back in Belgium, 1918. We're here along with the 2nd Canterbury Battalion, is stationed east of Ypres in the Polygon sector. Although trench skirmishes and general trench warfare continued, there was somewhat of a stalemate on the Western Front as the war entered its fourth year. Later in January, when frosty nights were followed by sunny days, numerous casualties were caused in the mornings by the contents of gas shells fired during the night. The gas had remained in liquid form till the heat of the sun caused them to evaporate. It appears to be around this time that Thomas was gassed for the second time. While again there is no evidence as to the type of gas used, or the severity and immediate impact on Thomas, there is reason to believe that this may have occurred because of gas shells being fired and thawing the following day. Once again, there is no record of hospitalization in Thomas's military documents, so Thomas possibly was only slightly affected. The New Zealand division had now been in the line for over three months, and was due and quite ready for its turn in Corps Reserve. On the 8th of February, Thomas proceeded for leave once more in England, once again, it is presumed, he departed France for England from Etap, arriving in Dover, and in training for London, arriving there on the 9th of February. Little did he know that he was leaving the Western Front for the last time. Meanwhile, the 2nd Canterbury Battalion was relieved on the 23rd of February, and moved to West Farm Camp. From there, they marched to Ypres, and from there, entrained to the new training area. On the 25th of February, Thomas, while on leave in England, reports as sick and is admitted to number 2 New Zealand General Hospital at Walton-on-Thames. He is then diagnosed as having influenza, not an uncommon illness given the time of year combined with the truly terrible living conditions troops were being exposed to on the Western Front. The number 2 New Zealand General Hospital, or number 2 NZGH, was the first hospital in the United Kingdom used specifically for soldiers of the New Zealand Expeditionary Force. The hospital opened in 1915 by requisition of the 15th century Mount Felix Estate, a grand house with gardens. In 1916, a new hospital was built in Brokenhurst, Hampshire as the number one New Zealand General Hospital, and Mount Felix renamed number two New Zealand General Hospital. Approximately 27,000 New Zealand soldiers were treated at the hospital during the war. The hospital closed in 1920. On March 7, Thomas is transferred from number two NZGH at Mount Felix to the New Zealand Convalescent Hospital. Grey Towers at Hornchurch in Essex. The Grey Towers was a mansion with 85 acres of grounds on Hornchurch Road in Hornchurch. In January 1916 it was decided the Grey Towers would become the command depot of the New Zealand contingent, although this was later changed, and from July 1916 it was used as the New Zealand Convalescent Hospital with 1500 beds. During his time in hospital, it is determined that Thomas is suffering from a condition known as Disorderly Action of the Heart, or DAH. DAH, also known as Soldier's Heart, is a psychiatric syndrome which presents a set of symptoms similar to those of heart disease. These include fatigue upon exertion, shortness of breath, palpitations, sweating and chest pain. The 
term soldier's heart was first coined in the post-American Civil War era. Then by World War I a physical explanation was shell shock, that the effects of heavy artillery shelling in the confines of trench warfare were somehow disrupting neuronal connections, so nerves were actually affected. Combat exhaustion and fatigue were also physical manifestations. Today we would know DAH as a form of post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. Treatment was at the time in its early infancy, but included removing the patients from strenuous activity, a reclined position and forced bed rest were the most beneficial as well as pharmacological intervention in the form of glycosine drugs. Through his medical records, we are able to determine that Thomas's PTSD manifested itself more in a physical form as opposed to a psychological one. The effects of shell shock could be extremely debilitating, both physically and mentally. While moving up to the trenches during his first time on the Western Front, NCO Frederick Holmes witnessed someone suffering from it. Uh, we stayed the night in a, a building without a roof, the <laughs> four walls, uh, and there I saw my first shell shock case, a fellow lying, crying and shaking like an aspen. It was pitiful, really. I asked, what, uh, asked somebody what, uh, what was his trouble and said it's a shell shock case. He was just waiting to be transported down home. It was a terrible thing, I didn't realise it was as bad as that. If you want to find the captain, I know where he is. I know where he is. I know where he is. On the 20th of March 1918, the Germans launched their Great Spring Offensive. The New Zealand Division, which was back up to full strength and trained in open warfare tactics, was rushed forward three days later to stem the breakthrough, which threatened Amiens. The 2nd Canterbury Battalion was heavily involved. After confused fighting, they along with other battalions from the division eventually gained the upper hand and soon were counter-attacking and stabilising the British line. I saw him drunk upon the cookhouse floor. I saw him drunk upon the cookhouse floor. If you want to find the quartermaster, I know where he is. I know where he is. I know where he is. If you want to find the quartermaster, I know where he is. He's drinking up the company rum. I saw him, I saw him drinking up the company rum. I saw him drinking up the company rum. A medical board hearing was held on the 11th of June 1918 for Private Thomas Benjamin Maclay at the New Zealand Convalescent Hospital, Hornchurch. This recommended that Thomas should be permanently unfit for war service and unfit for home service for six months due to the effects of DAH. This being the result of stress or fatigue, sometimes known as effect syndrome, it does not imply that there was any organic disease present. Thomas is subsequently granted leave in England and leaves the convalescent hospital on the 20th of June as soldiers recovering or recuperating were entitled to leave. With the hospital's proximity to London, it could be assumed that he spent time here again while on leave or perhaps went and experienced the English seaside at any number of locations on the southeast coast of England. On the 4th of July, Thomas was adjudged unfit by the New Zealand Medical Board and is placed on the New Zealand service role at the New Zealand Convalescent Hospital in Hornchurch. There was a variety of army roles that included the Army Medal Role, Army Reserve Role, Army Role of Honour and the New Zealand Service Role. Two days later, on the 6th of July, Thomas was readmitted to the New Zealand Convalescent Hospital on his return from leave.
From mid-August, the New Zealand Division excelled in the open country fighting that was brought about by the Allied Counter-Offensive, later known as the Hundred Days Offensive. The division, including the 2nd Canterbury Battalion, was often used to exploit initial breakthroughs made by the British divisions. Thomas remained at the New Zealand Convalescent Hospital until the 28th of August 1918. He was then released and then entrained for Torquay in Devonshire, arriving in Torquay later that same day. He was stationed here while he waited for repatriation back to New Zealand. Torquay in South Devonshire played a special part in supporting the campaigns of the Anzacs and in the return of the New Zealand troops at the end of the war. It was decided that Torquay would become a base for the New Zealand troops in 1917. The New Zealand camp was located in the water meadows in the lower Cockington Valley and the troops used Torquay as a location for R&R, &R, frequenting the local pubs and other venues such as the YMCA. They also recovered from their wounds in Torquay's hospitals, such as the one in the town hall. At the end of the war, between 40 and 50,000 men passed through the New Zealand Discharge Depot at St Mary Church. Many were directly repatriated from Torquay, with around 29,000 New Zealanders leaving from Howden Pier. They think of me and my wandering, but I never would be. Soldiers were also billeted at various locations in and around Torquay, such as Dazen Villa. Dazen housed New Zealand soldiers classified as permanently unfit and awaiting discharge, such as Thomas. It is not unrealistic to assume that Thomas may well have stayed at Dazen, and could well be in this photograph. Thomas receives the details of his return to New Zealand and on the 2nd of November Thomas leaves Torquay via the New Zealand Discharge Depot and entrains to Plymouth, Devonshire. I knew all the rules but the rules did not know me, guarantee. In its last action of the war, the New Zealand Division captured the ancient fortress town of Le Kenwa in a daring assault on November the 4th. The 3rd Rifle Brigade scaled the imposing walls with ladders and engaged the Germans with hand-to-hand -hand fighting. The few thousand German garrison surrendered. Soon after, New Zealand soldiers, including the 2nd Canterbury Battalion, entered the town itself on the 5th of November 1918. The war ended six days later on the 11th of November. The New Zealand Division represented the country's main contribution to the conflict in Europe. The cost of maintaining the division for two and a half years on the Western Front was appalling. Altogether some 13,250 New Zealanders died of wounds or sickness as a direct result of this campaign, including 50 as prisoners of war and more than 700 at home. Another 35,000 were wounded and 414 prisoners of war were ultimately repatriated.
The total casualties therefore approached 50,000, well over half the number of those who served in France or Belgium. In 2013, I had the privilege of visiting and walking these battlefields and cemeteries in Belgium. However, at the time I was unaware of Thomas's involvement in these campaigns. On the 6th of November 1918, Thomas leaves from Plymouth aboard the SS Ayrshire, bound for New Zealand. Along with Thomas aboard were 30 officers and nurses and 803 returning soldiers. On the 16th of December 1918, aboard ship, Thomas attends a medical board examination, which determines that his condition has improved considerably and confirming he is permanently unfit for war service and unfit for home service due to DAH and its associated condition. The SS Ayrshire arrived in Auckland on the 24th of December 1918 and Thomas disembarked the same day having spent the past 1,026 days on overseas deployment and is now almost 41 years of age. Thomas's army service records, although concise with certain dates, actions and locations, are often limited in actual information due to the secrets of war information at the time. We can through news items, diaries and publicised accounts piece together Thomas's supposed movements with the 2nd Canterbury Battalion while on overseas deployment. There is no doubt that Thomas, aged 37, enlisted in Timaru against both his parents' and wife's wishes, trained at Trentham, embarked for France via Egypt and trained, served, fought and was wounded on the Western Front. Thomas was hospitalised four times due to various illnesses gassed twice and eventually invalided out of active service before returning home to New Zealand in late 1918. Thomas's service records also show how the illnesses and injuries suffered during his deployment affected his health greatly in the immediate years after his return. He was exposed to some of the worst conditions possible on the Western Front, but like many veterans, never recorded or spoke of his experiences. The fact Thomas was invalided out of service with a form of shell shock or PTSD was testament to the level of the horrors that he and the New Zealand troops were exposed to. How it ultimately affected Thomas's state of mind is unclear. However, he is described by many in later life as cheerful and outgoing, with good humour. Thomas could be counted as one of the fortunate returned servicemen, who after serving and surviving the trenches of the Western Front, was able to return to New Zealand and go on to live a long, full life.
On the 21st of January 1919, Private Thomas Benjamin Maclay is formally discharged from the New Zealand Expeditionary Force. Thomas's address is listed as York Place, Dunedin, Otago. He is issued with the Silver War Badge upon his discharge. Later in January, Thomas and family are listed as residing at 16 Nicholson Street, South Dunedin. After a period of convalescence on discharge from the New Zealand Expeditionary Force, it can be assumed Thomas resumed his employment with the New Zealand Railways, and this was quite possibly a railways house. The property is located close to New Zealand Railways hillside workshops, where Thomas may well have been employed initially on light duties. When the family came to live in Arthur's Pass is unknown. However, I believe it to be later in 1919. The children, Russell, Yolande and Joy, were aged 15, 13 and 6, respectively. With the large project of the Oterra Tunnel still under construction and the maintenance of the Midland Line between Arthur's Pass and Christchurch, there was undoubtedly plenty of employment within the railways in the area. Thomas was now employed as a railway ganger, or a plate-laying foreman. The Oterra Tunnel, a railway tunnel on the Midland Line in the South Island of New Zealand between Oterra on the Westland side of the Southern Alps and Arthur's Pass on the Canterbury side, runs 8.5 kilometres beneath this mountain range. The gradient is 1 in 33, and the Oterra end is approximately 250 metres lower than the Arthur's Pass end. Construction commenced in 1907, and the tunnel was opened on the 4th of August 1923, becoming the longest tunnel in the British Empire. Because of its length and gradient, gases such as carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide could build up, so steam engines could not be used. Therefore, the tunnel was electrified. Steam engines of the day would be replaced with electric locomotives at either end before the trains entered the tunnel. There were eight fatalities during the construction. Sometime during 1920, Thomas was involved in a shotgun accident in Arthur's Pass, resulting in most of his right hand being shot away. When told by the doctor that he might have to have his injured hand amputated, he responded by saying, You might as well bloody cut my head off. Well into his 80s, Thomas still shot and fished, doing as much with his maimed hand as most people do with a whole one. It is notable that in any photographs of Thomas after his accident, that he often concealed his injured hand. I was unable to find any further information pertaining to this accident. The 11th of July 1920 saw the passing of Thomas's mother, Ellen, aged 78, in Wakwaiti. We can assume that Thomas and possibly his family attended his mother's funeral in Wakwaiti, especially having missed his father John's passing in 1916, as he was in France. On July 28, 1920, Thomas is admitted to the Chalmers Ward at Christchurch Hospital. The Chalmers Wards were a new block of the Christchurch Hospital constructed with donated funds from the Chalmers family of Ash Burton and appropriated to military uses with the consent of the donors. Thomas is recommended by the War Pensions Board for inpatient treatment for rheumatism and neuritis and was sent by a medical officer for examination by a dentist. The dentist reports Cannot do anything with teeth. All should be extracted and that the cost should be covered by military pension. It is presumed, via evidence from Thomas's medical records, that after being admitted on the 28th of July, he would have received treatment for rheumatism, a disease marked by inflammation and pain in the joints, muscles or fibrous tissue, 
and neuritis, inflammation of the peripheral nerve or nerves, causing pain and loss of function. Thomas is discharged from hospital on the 2nd of September 1920. Presumably his health had improved enough for this to occur. On the 15th of October, Thomas is readmitted to Chalmers Ward at Christchurch Hospital, as the state of his health must have deteriorated. Thomas's file contains a letter written on behalf of Thomas by a colonel from the ADMS Medical Headquarters of the Canterbury Military District, on this date. This letter implores that Due to the condition of his teeth and gums, T.B. Maclay is experiencing a chronic illness with debilitating continuous muscular pain and septic poisoning from the teeth. This is a direct result of being gassed twice, combined with the general conditions of trench warfare during the war. He should receive inpatient treatment at no cost, covered by the military, and if his teeth are removed, this would result in his condition improving considerably. Thomas is discharged from the Chalmers wards on the 7th of January 1921 and readmitted the same day into the general wards of Christchurch Hospital. It seems that he may have been readmitted the same day for surgery, most probably for the extraction of his teeth. On the 12th of January 1921, Thomas is discharged from hospital in Christchurch. We can assume that moving forward he continued to have outpatient care until his recovery, and his replacement teeth were fitted. Thomas and family are listed as living still in Arthur's Pass. On the 16th of June 1921, Thomas received his British War Medal for service in the Great War, as it was still known at the time. We assume by post that information was not available. Six days later, on the 22nd of June, Thomas's lodger, Clarence George Davis, a truck hand aged 20, and Thomas's two daughters, Yolanda 15 and Joy 8, were burned about the face and hands when a high powered lamp exploded. The accident happened at Thomas and Helen's residence, a railway house in Arthur's Pass. The injuries were serious enough that a special train was organised to take the injured parties to Christchurch Hospital. It appears that Thomas was only slightly injured, while the others were described as having severe burns. There was also no mention of his son Russell or Helen in an Ashburton Guardian newspaper article from the 23rd of June. As previously mentioned, the 4th of August 1923 saw the opening of the Otera Tunnel. Thomas and family were still living in Arthur's Pass and would have no doubt experienced the opening of the tunnel firsthand. Thomas and Helen's son Russell may well have started work on the railways himself by this stage, possibly at an apprentice level, as he was in his late teens. On the 16th of April 1924, Thomas received his victory medal for the Great War. We assume it was posted, however this information was once again unavailable. His address is still listed as Arthur's Pass. The New Zealand Rugby Union team which toured the United Kingdom, Ireland, France and Canada in 1924-25 was nicknamed the Invincibles after it won all 32 of its games overseas. The tour included test matches against Ireland, England, Wales and France and overall the team scored 838 points and conceded only 116. The team was captained by Cliff Porter, although injury restricted him to 17 games, including the test against France. Vice-captain Jock Richardson took over the captaincy for the remainder of the tour. The team included some of the great names of New Zealand rugby, including Cyril and Morris Brownlee, and the legendary George Nepier. 
who somewhat incredibly played in all 32 tour matches. The New Zealand cricket team toured England in the 1927 season. The team contained many of the players who had later played Test cricket for New Zealand, but the tour did not include any Test matches. The team was captained by Tom Lowry, who played first class cricket in England for Somerset and Cambridge University. In all 17 players were used on the tour, including future Test star Stewie Dempster and dual international and future Test captain Curly Page. The New Zealanders played against 16 of the 17 first class counties with 5 won and 4 lost. They also played 12 other matches, mostly of two days duration, winning 6 of them and drawing the others. New Zealand gained full test match status three years later in 1930. By 1928, Thomas, aged 50, Helen, 45, and their daughter Joy, who was 15 at the time, were noted as living in Waitaki, Otago. Waitaki Bridge is a small locality on the Otago side of the Waitaki River. It appears Thomas would have moved here sometime in 1926, still employed by the New Zealand Railways. Waitaki is on the South Island Main Trunk Line and would have been a busy railway sector at the time. On the 15th of January 1930, Thomas and Helen's son, Thomas Russell Maclay, aged 26, married Abby Margaret McLaren, also 26, in Omaru, my grandparents. Their first son, Thomas, or Uncle Tom, was born the following year. In 1932, Joy Nolene McClay passed away aged 19 from meningitis. There is very little information regarding her illness. The cause and the length of the illness is unknown. Meningitis is an inflammation of the fluid and membranes surrounding the brain and spinal cord. The causes can be bacterial, viral, fungal and parasitic and symptoms may include sudden high fever, stiff neck, severe headache, nausea, seizures, skin rash, no appetite and no thirst. Sometimes the complicated disease is only detected post-mortem. It is unknown as to the length of Joy's illness, but her death would have been devastating for Thomas and Helen and the family. Later in September 1932, Russell and Abby Margaret welcomed a second son, my father, Anthony Peter Maclay, or Tony, who was born in Martin in the Manawatu. Russell was employed by the New Zealand Railways and was based in Martin at the time. The census of 1936 records Thomas's residence as still Waitaki, Otago. He was aged 57 years and was employed as a railway ganger. That same year, Joy Marie was born, Auntie Joy, to Russell and Abby Margaret. In the following years leading into the Second World War, there is little information on Thomas and Helen. They had both become grandparents in 1925 while still in Arthur's Pass, when their eldest daughter Yolanda, or Yo, had given birth to her first daughter. Thomas would have adopted the nickname of Grumpy sometime after this, as it appears this was a child's corruption of Grandpa. It seems that Thomas retired from the New Zealand Railways in the early 1940s, 
as on the 1946 census it is recorded that he had retired. There had been no census taken in New Zealand five years previously due to the Second World War. It is however recorded on the 1946 census that Thomas and Helen were living in Omaru. Presumably he and Helen moved the 20 kilometres south to Omaru from Waitaki upon retirement. Thomas is now 68 years old. Even though the residence was listed as Omaru in 1946, it is possible that they had purchased the cottage in Waikawaiti, 226 Main Road, as noted in the Maclay Family Tree, 1979. Retiring from the New Zealand Railways, Tom and his wife bought the cottage on the corner of Main Road and Beach Street in Waikawaiti. Here he continued to live a full life, tending his garden and walking many miles, some days in pursuit of fish and fowl. That being said, in 1949 their residence was still noted as being in Omaru. In 1957, that residence had changed to Dunedin North. Thomas, now aged 79, and Helen, 74, have now by this stage moved to a Dunedin North address. This may have been for a variety of reasons, closer to family in Dunedin being one of them, but this is only speculation. Thomas and Helen may well have been in the process of moving back to Waikawaiiti, so this may have been the reason for living in Dunedin at this time. The Dunedin Cable Tramway System was a group of cable tramway lines in the New Zealand city of Dunedin. It is significant as Dunedin was the second city in the world to adopt the cable car, the first being San Francisco. Opening on the 23rd of March 1883, the Mornington Line travelled 1.6 kilometres up High Street to Mornington. This line was the steepest recorded tram line in the world. The Mornington Line was the last to close on the 2nd of March 1957, leaving San Francisco with the only operational cable car system in the world. Cable Car House is still clearly marked in the shopping area, having had little external changes since the line closed. On 25th of June 1959, Thomas Russell Maclay passed away, aged 54, in Dunedin. He was buried in Wakawaiti. Russell had been diagnosed with cancer and was survived by his wife Abby Margaret and their three children, Tom, Tony and Joy. Tom had married Helena Karam in 1957 and had one son, John born in 1958, while Joy had married Aldred John Williams, also in 1958, in Plymouth, England. In 1959, they welcomed their first daughter, Amanda. While my father Tony was unmarried at this stage, but was married in January 1960 to Brenda Elizabeth Blackmore of Balclutha. In 1963, Thomas and Helen are residing at 226 Main Road South, Waikawaiti. Thomas was now back living in Waikawaiti, having come full circle back to the town of his birth. Later that year, on the 19th of November, Helen Ida Maclay passed away of natural causes in Wakawaiti. She was buried in St John's Cemetery in Beach Street. There is little information available on Helen's life outside of what is documented via Thomas's. Helen was born in Geraldine, South Canterbury, where she married Thomas. It would have been a rather difficult time for her at times, 
especially dealing with Thomas being away at war for three years with three young children, along with his associated health issues upon his return from Europe. Also, the tragic loss of joy to meningitis at a young age must have been deeply distressing to Helen and Thomas. I was unable to find any evidence of employment for Helen, and she and the children may have had to rely on the help of family members for financial support. Helen was obviously a loving, caring woman who, like many women of the era, she displayed a strong-willed resilience and independence. On the 30th December 1964, Thomas Benjamin Maclay, Grumpy, passed away at his home in Wakawaiti. He is buried with Helen at St. John's in Wakawaiti, he was 86 years old. Undoubtedly a colourful character, much of Grumpy's life was well documented. Grumpy was a man of the land and the outdoors. Growing up in rural Otago, he was an accomplished rider, a great marksman, and possessed a can-do attitude and an obvious sense of adventure. This, combined with his sense of duty and service, drove him to enlist for the South African War, although only seeing limited service due to the war ending soon after his arrival in Africa. Some 13 years later, after his marriage and the birth of his three children, he for some unknown reason, and against his parents and Helen's wishes, he enlisted for the New Zealand Expeditionary Force at 37 years of age. Thomas's service during World War I was a difficult one, and though not unique in any sense of the word, he did experience some of the worst conditions imaginable on the Western Front. Injured, hospitalised on numerous occasions, and eventually invalided out of the war, he suffered from some serious health issues upon his return to New Zealand. However, once he had recovered, these issues never seemed to resurface again. Thomas did on occasion seem to have his fair share of luck, avoiding some of New Zealand's more costly battles with illness or injury prior to the engagement. Whether it was good luck or just good measure, who are we to judge? Grumpy, like many veterans of the war, never spoke of his experiences and whether this was a way of blocking them out or forgetting we will never know. Thomas held a wide variety of employment throughout his life. Contractor, musterer, rabbiter, plate layer, faceman, railway ganger and foreman meant that Thomas saw a lot of New Zealand, particularly its wilderness and remote areas, which obviously guarded his love of hunting and fishing, which was passed down through the generations. Well, he smiled and kissed me strong as death I saw his red tongue and I felt his sweet breath Mac, Johnny and Grumpy three men, three Maclays three stories that we remember from over the sea Shipped it down on the rim of the sky And I waited while three long summers went by Three long summers went by And one morning on the way I saw a great ship coming from sea Slowly she came across the bay and her flashing rigging was shot away And all around her way the seabirds cried They flew in and out of the hole in her side Slowly she came into the path of the sun I heard the sound of a distant gun, of a distant gun. There 
Then a stranger came running up to me from the deck of the ship and said, said he, Oh, are you the boy who would wait by the key with a little silver penny and an apricot tree? For I've got a plum colored fez and a drum for thee. I've got a sword and a pile key from over the sea. Why have you brought me children's toys? Brought me children's toys.